Well, it was like being in a room with brilliant minds, just like catapulting ideas at each other. And often before the idea was even articulated, the other person understood it and, and was refining it. And it was just like being in, in a room full of electric bolts. There is an energy, there is an integrity, there is a collaborative quality uh, to the work that we do. The biggest risk to the world is not nuclear or dramatic, it's apathy. My belief is that in a democracy, unless the public is aware, you're not going to get any action. IPPR from the beginning had a degree of objectivity, of determination to be independent in what it said, not to be influenced by those who helped to fund it, which I think was exceptional. The twin pillars on which the IPPR was founded was a, a firm belief in uh, social justice and the importance of a successful uh, market economy. One of the key things that at Policy Exchange we directly tried to borrow from the IPPR was the idea that it was evidence-based research and certainly on the right most of the institutions were ideology-led rather than evidence-led and we felt that IPPR had done something very important in establishing that what they were interested in is facts. I think IPPR has done a very good job in trying to bring the argument down to the facts, the projections, the real problems, and that's helped to, I think, make the whole discussion about immigration and migration outwards uh, more soundly based. It has lifted that from being an exchange of prejudices into a much more thoughtful discussion about the need for migrants, where they settle, how they live. And that's been very important, I think, in taking some of the poison out of the whole discussion. Certainly, framing the debate around immigration and diversity in the way that the IPPR have has been terribly important post 7-7. Our culture has become <clears throat> quite cold, in my opinion when it comes to issues around immigration and diversity. It somehow has shrunk. And the IPPR allowing the debate, and, and I think that they have done this, to look at the positivity of immigration, to look at its pluses, not just its minuses, to look at diversity as a contributing factor to not only a harmonious society, but a productive society. We know that in areas from energy policy to transport policy uh, to what we do in the homes, how we heat our homes, we're going to have profound changes in our ways of life. Uh, and IPPR's uh, work is more relevant, for, for, to my mind, in this area almost than any other. I think what's most impressive about IPPR is that they are at the leading edge locally and internationally on climate change. They pioneered a project uh, around the country where people who are living in places called Green Street or Green Road or Green Avenue can be, can, were in competition with each other to see who could cut their carbon emissions more. And I actually happened to visit uh, the eventual winner uh, in Leeds and it had a huge effect on the behaviour of people in that area. And at the same time, the Global Climate Network of IPPR offers international leadership, which is essential uh, if we're to get the kind of global agreement that we need. I think the Global Clim Climate Network is a very good initiative because, after all, this is a global problem. And if we want to tackle it across the planet, we necessarily need partnerships. We have begun to work with a far wider range of players. We can't afford just to work with one political party or one movement. We're interested in working with all of those people who believe in a more just, uh, fairer, more democratic, sustainable world. And the big challenges are going to be ones which uh, affect every political party. So whether that's the ageing society or the challenge of security or climate change, we think that IPPR has got many of the ideas and the research to be able to provide solutions to that.
Our economy has grown in a particular way over the last 10 years. It's been driven by uh, household consumption and government consumption, both driven by debt. That's not going to be the motor for our economy in the next 10 years because we've all borrowed too much. So what is the motor going to be and how do we encourage it? You can deal with the banks and you can deal with the recession, but you still have to deal with the global imbalances. And that means that America has to save more and East Asia and China have to consume more. And that readjustment and realignment is not going to happen just because people want it to. It's going to take policies. It's a time to be asking big questions and doing it uh, from a rather radical perspective. What are the policy frameworks that would get in place uh, the source of new jobs and new investment in the future? This is a sort of, this, should, this is meat and drink to organisations like our PBR. I think it probably is still the, the sort of the lead institution that everybody, the benchmark that everybody measures themselves against. I think what's remarkable about this organisation is how the values of IPPR haven't changed in 21 years. And yet the way in which IPPR works continues to adapt, continues to be flexible, continues to respond to and anticipate the political needs of the day. I think what the IPPR do is they're, they're wonderful catalysts for the right debate. Letting us speak, telling us to speak, almost forcing us to speak about the things that count and that matter. It has this interesting combination of intellectual rigour and moral courage and therefore puts out ideas which then become catalysts for change. And I think all this happens because it's run by two women. <laughs> perception of the organisation is that it's very much focused on uh, domestic policy for Westminster. We now work in 26 countries. Uh, we have a much greater feel for the global challenges that we face and understanding that actually for, for a think tank now in the 21st century to operate in a way that's really effective, it has to stretch from global to national right down to the neighbourhood because that actually is how you create change. I think the world faces, faces lots of challenges and whatever challenges you look at, they, they boil down to the same thing, which is that if the world was a fairer place, if there was a greater sharing of opportunities, if people have the sense of uh, autonomy and control over their lives, and if we can find a way of creating progress without damaging our environment, then we will be richer, more prosperous and happier. So those key aspects, equality, democracy, sustainability, lie at the heart of our vision for a better society.